I've never run a marathon, but I presume it's, it's uh, you have to get out there and just do it. Um, if you look at this, you know, the marathon, Boston Marathon is over 120 years old. For most of its history, about, um, you know, 40 to 50 people ran the marathon. Uh, the big spike is its anniversary in the uh, mid-90s. But, uh, you know, it's 20 to 25,000 people running the marathon. I mean, they began managing and cutting it off. And if you think Boston's an exception, there's Berlin. You know, 1974, 286. By 2009, they have over 40,000 people. So why does it take off like that? What happens? I mean, there's sort of cultural reasons. There's personal reasons. But I think one of the reasons it does take off is because of amateurs. That there are more amateurs running the race. In some ways it started as amateurs. There were no prizes. But I like this picture because in the beginning, these are the people that hope to win the race. These are people that just hope to finish. Right? And, and finishing just means I have improved my time or I ran with friends. I mean, it's very serious and meaningful to them, but it's a, it's a different mindset. So I think when we look at making, and, and then it's sort of realize uh, everybody's not doing it for the same reason. They have their own reasons. And that's really what's so fascinating. The reasons are so rich and different. Some people want to start a business. Some people have plenty of work to do with their business. They're looking for something to do on the side that's fun and interesting. So um, that's one of the lessons. But I also did a timeline of the marathon. And I think this is kind of you know, it doesn't exactly apply, but, uh, you know, they have a uh, thousand marathoners in the early 70s. They begin allowing women to run the race. You know, by 2009, there are 10,000 women running the Boston Marathon. Um, there are other things that change and allow that to grow. And uh, again, I'm I'm interested in how do we get more people on to this. And the other thing I kind of studied a bit was, you know what really made this possible? Was that the formation of clubs and running cl uh, you know, track clubs began reaching out and offering training to people. So you didn't necessarily have to say, I'm a marathoner, I was born to be a marathoner. You could just show up and say, do you think I could run a marathon? And they say, if you want to, train, you can do it. And it's a difference in attitude. But this, this is a, a, a training site, but they, they begin figuring out how to on-ramp people into marathoning. And it, again, it doesn't mean that they're going to run the fastest race. It simply means they're going to finish, they hope. And so there's some lessons from that. I think in terms of participation, events offer us deadlines, whether it's in the ducky race or Maker Fair. It gives us a reason to just do something and, and get it done. Um, but it was also the spread of marathons. Over, you know, it wasn't just the Boston Marathon that became popular. There were over 1,200 large marathons. And of course, we know all these fun runs, half, half marathons, and even formal ways of training. But uh, you know, the recognition, the reputation that you participated and you developed from that is, is extremely important. So I just use that as a background for us because what interests me, again, is here we are at a time when I think making looks like the early days of the Boston Marathon. There's just, I mean, literally we're 100 people here. We're a relatively small uh, group of people. But I think what's happening is making is going mainstream. It's positioned to really impact culture, innovation, and education. And it's, potentially can involve everyone. Um, if you just look at um, our growth around Maker Fair here, uh, you know, our first one was in 2006. We had about 22,000 people. We began introducing uh, the mini Maker Fairs. And now uh, we project this year about 85 Maker Fairs. And that, the number of people going to a Maker Fair that I don't organize is going larger than the ones I do organize. So. I don't know if that's a good thing, but <laughs> but, uh, but it is a good thing uh, in terms of um, it's really been a kind of uh, attractor for people that, that sort of get this on this fun level. And, and I think where, where I guess my main point tonight is I see that makerspaces 
are an on-ramp to the maker movement. They provide, like that track club, a place where you can go and learn how to do it. You find people that welcome you, and you find people that help you, and that tra can help train you. Again, I, I like the marathon example because making is hard. We're used to using technologies. We're consumers of technology. Relatively speaking, that's easy. Making is another level, but it's possible. And all of you, uh, I think, are demonstrating that. So as we look at uh, make, make your spaces today, this is a, a mission statement, a mission chart from uh, MakerWorks in Ann Arbor. Where's Dale? Dale Grover. There he is in the back. Um, you can talk to him about it, but he and his partner Tom Root started a space which I think is very similar in nature to uh, Artisans Asylum. And uh, I think, uh, you know, they see themselves as having a, 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 a triple mission. Um, one is to serve makers, and that includes hobbyists and people learning, and also people that are doing, that starting a business or running a business out of their space, but also students in education. And, you know, uh, innovation, education, solving problems, I, I would like to believe that all maker spaces do this. Um, some articulate it more clearly than others, but I think the maker spaces that I, I think will emerge do have, um, have these have these different dimensions to them and aspects to your mission. Another thing that is fascinating, this is an idea from Eric Ries of the Minimal Viable Startup, is like, a, I think what we're learning is, it's like, what is a minimal viable makerspace? If you're here trying to figure that out, it's really what allows you to get started and open the doors and, and start uh, working with people. Um, it isn't about how much technology you have. It's actually probably how much community you have and how much support you have. Um, and it's not necessarily dollars only. I think, um, I think the, the beauty of a space often is that people do seem to get it when they walk in. And when you tell them about it, they kind of glaze over a bit. When they walk in, they see the potential here. And I'm just thinking this, you know, how many rooms are there, how many buildings are there in America that are about this empty, right? <laughs> And, and, you know, they used to be something. They used to make things there. And the idea that we could occupy those buildings and make them productive is really fascinating. So the second idea here is, I think if you start small, you want to be as visible to the community as possible. You should really be telling your story and making sure you're not just a closed secret society. You have to be as visible to the community. I think that's why maker fairs are important. That's why we're working with other organizations is important to, uh, to reach more people. And kind of the last thing is, I sort of, um, I was preparing for, for this talk, and uh, on Twitter someone asked me, it was actually Tara Tiger Brown from LA Makerspace, uh, said, hey, do you know any software for managing membership? You know, is there any open source software for that? And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. There probably is or should be. But I think we can start thinking that there's a common infrastructure behind makerspaces, that some of these things don't need to be reinvented each time. And whether that's a business or an open source project, you know, just recruitment and outreach tools, membership management, purchasing and inventory management. I mean, these are, and, you know, some of the areas I work with in schools, it's really difficult, uh, you know, there's no, you're working on a spreadsheet here. Events management, insurance and compliance, and even commerce. And by that I mean 